Well, Revelation chapter 4 is where we are. And it's only got 11 verses in it, so it's a short chapter. But I didn't, I stopped at verse 6 last week. But I want to back up for a minute. Chapter 4, verse 1. The voice that John heard uh, the first time in chapter 1 is the same voice he hears in chapter 4. It sounded like a trumpet. It's the voice of Jesus. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speaking to him. And the voice said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So before I even get anything else new, I want to correct something I said last week. Um, I said last week that my preaching hero, John MacArthur, and I don't always agree with him on everything. Sometimes he's wrong. Uh, But I said that John MacArthur supported the interpretation that the phrase come up here, referring to the rapture of the church, that John MacArthur supports that view. Because a common view is that come up here, I even heard it preached myself. That means the rapture. Come up here, that's the rapture. And I said, a lot of people believe that. A lot of people teach that, even John MacArthur. And I guess I thought I had read that in his commentary, because I have his commentary, um, but I have several commentaries open, so I might have gotten confused. I thought I read it in there, but I was apparently wrong because after the service, Roger comes up to me with his John MacArthur study Bible, opens up the page where this note says, this is the quote, uh, this is not a veiled reference to the rapture of the church, but a command for John to be temporarily transported to heaven in the spirit to receive revelation about future events, which that was my interpretation. That was John MacArthur's interpretation. I said John MacArthur held to the view that it meant the rapture, but he doesn't. Then I said, well, maybe he changed his view and it's in his study Bible notes, but not in his commentary. So I go home and break out the commentary again and reread it. This is what his commentary says, quote, some see this command as a reference to the rapture of the church. However, the verse does not describe the church ascending to heaven in resurrected, resurrected glory, but John going to receive revelation. So there are many scholars and Bible teachers and brilliant men who do hold the view that come up here means the rapture of the church, and that's how they interpret it. John MacArthur does not. He's not one of them. I said he is, and I just wanted to correct that and change it. So my error... Last time that I said John MacArthur said that and John MacArthur didn't say that. And I can't stand it when someone comes up to me and says, hey, you know what John MacArthur said? And then they give you some kind of gobbledygook. No, he didn't say that. Yes, he did. And you go, no. And here I did it. So I want to fix that. So let's pick up from where we left off last time. Last time, John received a vision in the spirit of the throne of heaven. He's in heaven. He's come up to the door, he looks in the door and there's, he sees heaven and God is sitting on the throne. He sees someone sitting on the throne who is radiant and beautiful and precious, like precious stones. And I even believe it's precious stones. He called it a jasper, but I believe it's a diamond, like it's crystal clear, it's beautiful. Uh, And then there's an emerald colored rainbow emanating around the throne, a further depiction of God's beauty, just beauty. The whole thing is a beautiful picture, a beautiful scene. As God's majesty is on display, God's glory is on display in this throne. And then there are the 24 elders around the throne. Now, I confess I was confused. I am still confused. I don't know exactly what these 24 elders mean and who they are, what they represent. But I think they probably represent God's people throughout redemptive history. Something like the 12 tribes of Israel, and the 12 apostles. In fact, I'll give you a, a Revelation 21 says this, talking about the, the city, the heavenly city. It had great high walls with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the, at the gates. And on the gates are written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the heavenly city has 12 gates and each gate has a name of a tribe of Israel on it. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you got 12 apostles, you got 12 tribes of Israel. That's 24. It kind of makes sense. Maybe the 24 elders represent all of God's people in redemptive history. People of Israel, people of the church. So then John sees this too, that there were flashes of lightning 
rumblings and peals of thunder. I misspelled peals there in my notes. Uh, indicating God is, you're there's the throne and it's beautiful, but all of a sudden you hear flashes of lightning, peals of thunder. It's probably pretty loud and it would certainly uh, cause you to fear. Uh, God's fearful presence, God's awe-inspiring presence, God's power. You know you're in the presence of just pure power. God's power, because it's God. And then the Holy Spirit is there too. This is Trinity language. You have the voice of Jesus speaking, like the trumpet. You have God on the throne, the one seated on the throne. And then it says the seven spirits of God were around the throne, which is the Spirit. We, we interpreted that in chapter 1. So that's all we looked at last time. And we'll pick up from there and finish the chapter, starting in verse 6. He says, also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So more beautiful imagery, more amazing imagery. There's the throne, there are the 12 elders, there's the seven spirits, there's the emerald rainbow, there's the peals of thunder, the flashes of lightning, all that stuff there. And then all of a sudden you see this glass sea. Now in the book of Revelation, there are many seas pictured and every time you see a sea in Revelation, it always means something else. So you can't say, oh, here's a sea. It must mean this because every time there's a sea, it represents something else in the book of Revelation. It never really means the same thing. But here the sea is this expanse. And the expanse uh, separates the throne and then everything else. The, the expanse, the sea that he sees uh, separates God on the throne from everything, all creation. At least that's what I'm looking at. I'm, I'm thinking of it, maybe I'm thinking of it like a glassy floor in heaven. So there's God sitting on this floor made of glass, like it's a shiny, pretty floor, crystal on it. Um, sea of glass, clear as crystal. No, no. This is also in the Bible and other places, this same kind of a scene. I know the writers of the scripture didn't exactly word it the same way, but I think they're talking about the same thing because the people who got to see it saw the same thing. In Exodus chapter 24, Moses, uh, verses 9 and 10, Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, Nadab and Abihu are Aaron's sons, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Exodus 24, and then under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. You know what they saw? I think they saw the sea of glass. They just described it as a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. John saw a sea of glass that was clear as crystal. Same thing. I think it's the same thing. And in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel describes spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse sparkling like ice and awesome what is an expanse probably like something like a floor or a sea a glass sparkling like ice clear shiny when the sun hits it and the light hits it it sparkles I think it's the same thing that's what I believe and so you have the sea of glass and you go, what in the world can that possibly mean? And there's so many pictures here, so many images here, and so many interpretations that you read about. And then you're like, well, I don't know if anybody really knows exactly what it means. But probably something like God is the truth of God being separate from everything else in creation. The sea would represent he's on a sea of glass and everything else is under that. Everything else is aside from that, apart from that. Everything is... Uh, on the other side of that, that he is the high and lofty one. He is majestic. He is awesome. His being is awesome. He is holy and transcendent, and that sea would represent that. At least I think that's a pretty good interpretation. Um, other guys think differently. And then from here, in this verse, this is where the worship begins in heaven. A lot of worship in the book of Revelation. A lot of worship. A lot of praise. A lot of giving glory to God. And it starts right here. 
verse 6. Verse 6 through 8, it says, In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Now, make your little mental note. I don't know how, what it looks like, but just, as you see it, you have four creatures, eyes everywhere. All right? The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. So it mentions eyes twice, got eyes all over it. All right, four of them. Now these four creatures are in the center, it says, in the center or near the throne, around the throne, surrounding the throne, all around it, these four creatures. And now these four creatures appear several times in the book of Revelation. We're going to see them again. They show up again. But I want to hopefully I can get a decent interpretation of who they are and what they are now. So next time when we reference them, we won't have to study it all over again. We might do it anyway, but these are sort of strange looking beings, right? Bizarre. Uh, Otherworldly appearances. And some have interpreted these as angels or cherubs, cherubim. In fact, that is what they are, but Before I got into that, that's what I've interpreted them to be. Other people say that they're just symbolic. They have just they're symbolic only, and they're not real literal beings. But yet, different different scholars have different views of what what these guys, what these creatures are. But they have eyes all over their body, eyes all over them, everywhere. Which you go, what does that mean? Well, one thing it means for sure, they can probably see really well. (laughs) <laughs> well they do they have eyes of which they can see everything they see everything in creation they see everything all over the place they can see um, everything that's happening in the creation they can see it so I think that these living beings are representative of creation these four beings and I also believe that the, the, the exact same beings that Ezekiel saw in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1 and in chapter 10. But um, he had a vision, a similar vision of heaven. He saw heaven. And he says, in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was like that of a man. But each of them had four faces and four wings. So not exactly the same. They had four faces. But look at what he says. Uh, Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had hands of a man. All four of them had faces and wings, and their wings touched one another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a man, and on the right, and on the right each had the face of a lion, and on the left each had the face of an ox, and also had the face of an eagle. So the same faces... But John had four creatures. Each one of them had a face. This one has four living creatures, and each one of them has four faces. So I'm going to just try to explain what I think there are. Obviously, it's not exactly the same. There are differences. So what I think John saw is these four creatures only saw one side of the creature. Ezekiel saw all four sides of the creature. So if you see four creatures and all you see that guy, all you see is his front side. It's the face of a man. His front side is the face of a lion. His front side is the face of an ox. And the other guy's front side is the face of an eagle. Uh, That's what I think. And I want to just sort of punt a little bit and go, well, gee, how would you describe a heavenly vision? You saw this amazing thing, it's already overwhelming. Your mind is being blown because you've seen this throne, you've seen the sea of glass, you've seen the emerald, you've seen all these, how beautiful it is, and then you see these four creatures. How do you describe that? How would you write it down? So uh, I think they saw the same thing. I think they saw exactly the same thing. They just wrote it down and described it differently. Uh, But I think John's depiction gives us a little bit of detail about who these are. Ezekiel, uh, each one of the creatures had, each one of the creatures had four different dimensions. That's what I mentioned a while ago. Like what he saw was only part of their face. He didn't see 
everything that John saw. John saw four creatures, or John didn't see all four sides of the creature except that there are eyes everywhere. But in Ezekiel, they are cherubim. Ezekiel chapter 10, talking about the same four living creatures. Uh, chapter 10, verse 11 through 14, Ezekiel said the cherubim went went in whenever when went in whatever direction the head faced without turning as they went. So he's talking about the same thing from chapter one. Now he calls them cherubim. And you know what cherubim are? It's a special class of angel. And cherubim is plural. Anytime you see I am on the end of a Hebrew word, it's plural. It's like an S in English. It's cherub is singular. Cherubim is plural. These cherubim, whatever direction they went, without turning their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands and their wings were completely full of eyes. Same thing that John saw. As were their four wheels. No, John didn't see the four wheels. I heard the wheels being called the whirling wheels. So Ezekiel sees these wheels and Somebody's crying out, hey, bring the whirling wheel over here or something like that. They're called whirling wheels. And each of the cherubim had four faces. One face was that of a cherub. The second was that of a man. The third was that of a lion. And the fourth was that of a face of an eagle. So what John saw has already been described and talked about in the book of Rev- uh, in the Old Testament, Ezekiel. And I also believe Although Isaiah's description is very um, small compared to Ezekiel and John, but Isaiah saw the same thing. I really believe he did. He says in Isaiah 6, 2, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. And what do you think he saw? Same thing John saw. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So, It's majestic, just a majestic vision of God. And it says above him were seraphs. Seraphs are also a special class of angel, angelic being. And then he says each had six wings, same thing John says. So I believe that Isaiah, when he saw the God seated on the throne, he saw the same four living creatures. Now he doesn't say four, but he calls them seraphs and they had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces, and two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were flying. So you get to the book of Revelation, you're studying Revelation, you go, man, this is an amazing thing. What does this look like? How would you describe what it would be like if you saw it? I don't know. I did see on my YouTube feed, because people do crazy things on YouTube. One of them was like, told the AI machine, which now AI can do anything you want it to do, to draw a picture of this four living creatures. And it's like, that's probably what it really looked like. It's like, it's really amazing. Uh, all these different things. And you're like, hey, AI, go to Ezekiel chapter 10 and, just, and, and draw me that. And it'll do it. Anyway, it's really amazing. But same thing. Now, I'm not sure how to interpret this, what the significance of their physical features are. I don't know what the face of a man is supposed to mean or the face of an eagle or the face of a lion or the face of an ox is supposed to mean. There are many different interpretations about it and I'm not sure if anyone knows what it is or if anyone's right. If someone, any one of those interpretations that I read, which one's right? I have no idea, so I didn't put it in there. But it is astounding how many different views there are about, oh, well, the lion means this and the eagle means this. I don't know. But I do know this about the four living creatures. They serve in heaven a very significant and amazing, uh, very important feature. They serve around the throne functioning as worship leaders. It says in verse 8, day by day, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This is the same thing Isaiah said, right? Uh, 6 3, they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. That's what these four living creatures do. These four living beings around the throne do. They just cry out and sing and praise 
worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The whole earth is full of his glory. They constantly lead in worship around the throne. Never stop. On a repeat cycle. Over and over they repeat this hymn. By the way, too, in the book of Revelation, there are many hymns. There's a lot of hymns in the book of Revelation. And we're going to study them. This is the first one. And I just want to chase a little rabbit, a worship rabbit for a while. Maybe we'll finish it with this. You know, this is not the only biblical model for what to say in a praise and worship song. And I put song in print in the um, quotes. Because it doesn't say they were singing, it says they were saying. Same thing as the uh, angels that came to the shepherds the night that Jesus was born. They were saying glory to God in the highest. They weren't singing it. So we made a song out of it now. But now we think they were out there singing. Maybe they were, but it's what they were saying. It. But this is a good model, even though it's not the only model for how to sing a praise and worship song or how to write a praise and worship song, but it's definitely a good model, a perfect model, an excellent model. They're singing a hymn, they're saying a hymn about the holiness of God. All right, there I am at the throne, I'm, I'm blown away by the majesty, I'm blown away by the beauty, I'm blown away by the peals of thunder and the lightning, I'm blown away by the 24 elders, I'm blown away by these four living creatures, and they worship, and they worship God because he's holy. Their hymn is about holiness, God's holiness. Now, I would generalize it and try to make a principle for it. Lyrics that focus on the nature and character of God is what we sing. When you're singing a praise song, you're singing a worship song, you're singing a hymn, you're singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, songs that focus on the nature and the character of God, that's what we sing. Now, I've got more to add to that, and I will, but that's, that's what we're getting in right here. It's not the only worthy content about singing. It's not the only biblical content to sing, it, or otherwise any other kind of content that you would sing or, or say in a praise and worship when you're worshiping the Lord. But it's definitely a good model, and it's a good pattern to mimic in our worship time and when we sing together. This is the same the same. Him that the seraph sang when Isaiah saw him. I already said it. They, they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. They're singing a song about holiness. Now, there is a hymn. It used to be, Lisa, when you grew up, was your hymn book, was it the first song in the whole hymn book? Hymn number one. You've got to find the hymn book. <laughs> hymn number one. Anybody remember? Holy, holy, holy. That was the, song, that was the hymn. Yeah. Maybe we ought to sing that. But the key feature, the number one key feature of God's character is his holiness. He's holy. Now, every characteristic about his nature and his being and who he is, every one of those is superior to anything else there is, and it's vitally important. God is love. God is gracious. God is merciful. Everything about God is, is, is the ultimate you can have and you can't diminish any one of them. But his holiness is the number one characteristic of his being. That's what the angels sang. That's what the four living creatures sang. Their first song was, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's his holiness. And that goes along with all these flashes of lightning and the peals of thunder. You're in, in the presence of God. It's beautiful and glorious. And then it's something that, that depicts and shows you his awe, his majesty. His... It's awesome. And then they sing, holy, holy, holy. It means he's altogether outside the realm of sin and wickedness. God is not touched by sin. God is not affected by sin. God has no, nothing in him that is anything but pure and righteous. Sin is outside of him. It's not even near his character and his being. 
That's what holiness means. And sin offends God's holiness. I think it's very important that we understand that too because you get in the book of Revelation and all these bad things are happening. I mean, judgments on mankind, judgments on the world. And I mean, they're my people. These are my people. I don't want them to be judged. I feel sorry for my people. I don't want God to judge people. And so when I see him judging people, I immediately go, oh, man, that's not cool. Why are you doing that? But if you understand God's holiness, then it won't bother you at all. It's important that we understand this because we have to grasp God's anger against the wickedness of the world when he starts judging stuff. So have the book of Revelation, the throne room, revealing God's radiance and his beauty and his glory. You have this other, another characteristic to praise him for. But God must be worshipped because he's holy. The worship is started in heaven by the four living creatures because God is holy and it never stops. It says they say it all the time. They repeat, it's repeated. It's on a loop. Well, a long time ago, uh, we played with this drummer. He was really cool. He was, uh, remember the, I forget his name, but he, he was really cool. And he had a little studio, so we were in there playing music with him. And he, and he was showing him one of our songs, and he said, okay, loop it. That means just keep playing the same thing over and over again until we get a groove. Once we get a groove, then we can move on to something else. These guys are just looping this, worship, holy, holy, holy. Then it says, and by the way, too, this is also infectious spreads it says in verse 9 whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and praise glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever they lay their crowns before the throne and say say another hymn so you have other elements of worship that involve the nature and the character of God more than just reciting his holiness back to him, but you're reciting things to him, about him, for him, and whenever you do that, whenever you just recite back to God his nature, his character, his being, you're giving him praise. You're giving him honor. You're giving him worship. And that's what they're doing. Speaking to him about him with all gives him glory. So I would just say, you know, let's apply that to us on Sunday morning or just what we're saying. When you're singing, just we're singing uh, songs, praising God, just giving back to him words about him, to him, with all in our hearts. All and joy and these 24, el- all, these 24 elders fall down and worship. And so John... It's highlighting that. We attribute to God his worthiness. We attribute to him and we praise him for his majesty, his beauty, his greatness, his justice, his sovereignty, his redemption. Any other thing you can think about him, praise him for it. Anything. Because it's about him. He is God. So you have these hymns and psalms and spiritual songs they they play a role in our walk with God as we struggle through trials which is what the churches that John wrote the book of revelation to were dealing with emperor worship and all these other all this other junk coming and piling on them and here's this hymn that says focus on God and his holiness and his worthiness it'll change the way you think about how evil the emperor is the hymns by praising God and the lamb and Christ Show our loyalty is not to the rulers of this world, but to the one true God and to his son, Jesus. When we're full of praise and gladness, when when we are full of praise and gladness, when we see God and we see Christ in all their majesty and all their beauty, I mean, it's, it's a worship experience to recite back to him his glory but it blesses us. It changes us. It strengthens our daily lives. When you sing praise songs to God, and I know it's not every song, and I know it's not every song is, is equally uh, attractive or appealing to your sensibilities or music, 
at least not for me. But I like them. I like even the songs I don't like, I like. Um, they remind us of God's throne. They bring heaven to us. That's what singing hymns does. That's what praising God is. It's, it's bringing heaven close to us so we can just enjoy God's goodness and reflect on him while we uh, sing to him. And so the hymns recorded in the book of Revelation will bless our lives if we apply them to our, our worship. They will, as we encounter God in the book of Revelation, the hymns that are recorded there will change us. I just want to finish off with this. Singing got songs to God. This is some, some of my ideas about song, worship songs, hymns and songs you sing. All right, you sing songs to God about God, right? We're singing a song to God about God. You are this, you are that, you are great, you are wonderful, you are holy, you are gracious, you are uh, wonderful. All those songs we sing about God, about his character, to him. We sing about his nature, to him. We sing about his work, to him. God, you've saved me. God, you sent your son to die for me. That's what we sing. You have done um, work on my behalf to redeem me for yourself. I'm singing that to God, about God. And not just that work, but all of his other works too. That's what we'll do. We're going to make songs about God, his nature, his character, his work on our behalf and any other thing. But singing songs is also about singing about our response to God. I've heard people say that when you hear someone say, well, the song's not about you, it's about God. Oh yeah, well, I want to sing a song that says, Lord, I praise you. I worship you. I'm glad that you saved me. I'm going to sing. The lyric's going to say, I am changed because of you. My response is in the same song. Responding to who he is and what he has done for you, it's just good. Lord, I love you. With all my heart, I love you. You can sing that. That's a worship, that's a worship song. Lord, I love you. You've changed my life. I'm thankful. I thank you, thank you, thank you. I thank you. We're going to do that too. And we're going to sing songs to him that express to him how much we love him and how glad we are that he is our God, that he is our father. I have a father. He knows my name. It's a song of praise to God. God is honored in that. And that's what I want to say. It's infectious too. Uh, I said that up earlier. The 24 elders fall down in prostrate form. They fall down, humble themselves before the same holy God that the four living creatures uh, incite the worship with. They fall down and worship him. You start worshiping God, it's infectious. It's infectious not just to other Christians. I think it's not infectious in terms of worship, but it blows people's minds Uh, the T4G, I used to go to the T4G and there were 10,000 men in a room singing. You ever been in a room with 10,000 people singing a hymn? It makes you want to come out of your skin and fly out through the ceiling. And I started thinking things like, what if an unbeliever just walked in here and stood there and heard 10,000 Christians going, God, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Like, that's mind-blowing. God is worthy of our praise and it changes us. And these people are changed. They fall down and they throw their crowns at his feet. It says, they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Imagine that hymn that says that. All right, unbeliever comes in, 10,000 Christians are singing, you are worthy, O Lord and God. You were worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For you received, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being, and they lay their crowns down. Now you know what a crown's for, right? A crown means you've been given authority. A crown means you're in charge of something. You're a king, some kind of prince, some kind of ruler. 
So these people take their crown as a ruler and, and faithful, uh, which they receive, Paul says, uh, we get the crown, for the, uh, the crown for all who are waiting for his appearing. They're faithfully waiting for Jesus to come and so they get this crown and they humbly give it all back to God because he is over all and they only serve him. And when their voices, they make more songs, more hymns. They write more lyrics to praise God with and ascribe to him his worth and his value. And this time his worth and his value is uh, creation. We weren't even around. You created us. You created us. We sing a song here called, I will remember my creator all of the days of my life. I will remember my maker. You are my way, my life, my truth. That's a, that's, that would have been a song they would have sang. You're my creator, you're my maker. I'm going to remember you. So it's a lot to learn in Revelation, not just about the future, not just about the end time events, not just about the tribulation, not just about the destruction and the, and the 144,000 and the two witnesses and all those cool things. This is a hymn. This is a book about worship and praise. Let's pray. Lord God, we do uh, come to you tonight. We do praise you. Or you have created us for yourself. You have redeemed us for yourself. You bought us with the blood of your son for yourself. So that, Lord, we may, when that day comes, stand before you in the throne and just worship you in nonstop loop. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. For you created us. You gave us everything. You gave us, you are God. Praise you. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that you will uh, let that be our hearts tonight. You'll let that be our hearts all, every day. You'll especially let that be our hearts and our, with our tongues and our voices when we gather here on Sunday and we sing your praise. That will be what we do. We will praise you and give you glory and honor and tribute power to you. Do that. I beg you'll do that for us. Father God, I do pray that you will be gracious to us tonight going home. You'll be gracious to us the rest of our week that you will treat us with favor and love and every kindness and every good thing. And Father, I pray that you will um, give us wisdom and love for each other, wisdom in our actions and our, our words. I pray, God, you will be uh, merciful to us to bring us back together Sundays where we can sing your praise and worship you and fellowship with your people and hear your word and just grow in Christ and love Jesus with all our hearts. Father, I pray you'll do that for us, for his sake. Amen.